everyone, this is Tamara from ShelfAddiction.com and welcome to episode 3, an interview with Laura Bickle, a Book Chat Live author feature. This is my first of many live podcast interviews where I'm exclusively chatting with the talented authors that will be attending Rust City BookCon locally here in Troy, Michigan this August. For those of you that aren't in the loop with what Rust City is, I have a link below in the show notes or you can go to RustCityBookCon.com. RustCityBookCon.com. I did say that right. <laughs> I hope there are a few of you out there to interact with us on Spreaker. If you're listening live, feel free to chime in with any book-related questions that you may have for Laura. Laura is the author of adult fiction fantasy series Dark Alchemy. With her most recent release title, Mercury Retrograde, she's also written many other books in the fantasy genre, both in adult and the young adult arenas. Hey, Laura, thanks for joining me today. How are you? Hi, Tamara. I'm well. How are you? I'm doing okay. You know, not only is the weather gloomy, this podcast has been giving me issues. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mercury is technically in retrograde, and I am told that that causes all kinds of technological hassles, so we oh. can just blame it on the stars. Oh, my gosh. I'll take that because, you know... Um, A lot of people that know me know I'm a perfectionist, so when I start having issues, it's just like, oh my gosh, it's dramatic, I tell you. (laughs) It happens to everybody. Everybody. Well, thank you. So how are things in in your area? Well, things are kind of gloomy and gray today. We had some rain pass through earlier this afternoon, but it's not snow, so I'm I'm pretty happy. <laughs> we yeah. had kind of an early spring, so Yeah, that's a good thing, right? Well it is May, so you know it's about time, right? Yes. <laughs> awesome. So let's just jump right on in here. Uh, as you know, I, I know, I hear like a lot of writers read a lot if not more, than us book nerds. So go ahead and share with us what you're reading right now. Well, it seems like I never get to read as much fiction as I really want to when I'm writing because I'm always um, up to my ears in research. Um, That's one of the great things about being a writer is I have an excuse to research anything that I want and uh, play with it a little bit. So I've been reading a lot of Paracelsus and a lot about alchemy and a lot of history. And I uh, recently picked up a book that looked pretty interesting. It's called... Uh, The Dark Side of the Enlightenment, Wizards, Alchemists, and Spiritual Seekers in the Age of Reason. And it's by John Fleming. So I'm hoping to dive into that pretty soon and get some um, interesting ideas about what the alchemists and people of science were doing around the uh, Age of Enlightenment. Wow, that's kind of cool. It sounds like you might be doing a little research for your series. Oh, yes, I love, again, I love, love, love research. And uh, my new series, the Dark Alchemy series, does deal with alchemy and a lot of supernatural creatures. Uh, The first book in the series is Dark Alchemy. And the second book uh, recently came out. It's called Mercury Retrograde. And uh, they're kind of, I think the tagline that they used for them was um, Breaking Bad meets uh, Stephen King's Gunslinger. So they're contemporary fantasies, and they're based in a town in a small town in Wyoming that's not too far from Yellowstone that uh, was founded by an alchemist way back in the gold rush days. And the alchemist never actually mined any gold. He just sort of conjured it, and he created all kinds of other little alchemical projects and supernatural creatures that are roaming the the backcountry of Yellowstone. So I get to write about undead cowboys in the alchemical tree of life and drug dealing alchemists and and uh, all kinds of basilisks and, and other creatures that uh, wake up every once in a while and uh, terrorize the town so oh, wow that sounds interesting you know i never watched breaking bad all the way through season one but the bit i did watch it was crazy so i just can <laughs> imagine people like mixing things up and <laughs> making drugs and all other kind of craziness so I'm all for a good mashup. I, I just think that uh, that would be kind of what a modern day alchemist might be into. So I decided to run with it. That is hilarious. So Petra D, right? That's your mm-hmm. heroine's name. So what does she do? I mean, how does she, you know, play into this whole world? Well, a lot of westerns begin with a stranger coming to town, and that's how I decided to start this series. Uh, Stranger comes to town, and this is Petra D, and she is a geologist, and she is um, going to be working, um, taking soil samples and such in uh, Yellowstone. 
So she moves to Temperance, trying to get away from some uh, demons in her past, and uh, she winds up hip deep in all these supernatural things that she can't quite explain uh, with science. And she, in the process, she meets some undead cowboys and then winds up with a coyote familiar who shows up to her, her uh, trailer in the middle of the night uh, with uh, alchemical artifacts and such. So she has a lot of fun. I think she's a little bewildered. Uh, she's not really sure what to make of things, but she's a tough gal, and I'm, I'm pretty sure she'll figure it out. So undead cowboys. Now, is that like vampires or is that like zombies? Well, not really like either. I wanted to play with the whole undead idea a little bit. And this is a group of men who are called the Hanged Men. And they were uh, killed at the foot of the alchemical tree of life. And they were part of an alchemical experiment. So they walk around during the day as, as, as you know, everybody else does. And they've lived for more than 150 years. But every night they have to go below the tree to kind of rot and be regenerated. Wow. So... They're undead in a way, and they've got a lot of weaknesses, um, but a lot of strengths, too. Uh, they can uh, disincorporate and uh, turn themselves into ravens. So that's, that's probably the, the chief fun power uh, they get to play with. Wow, that is, like, right up my alley, seriously. I want to <laughs> learn and pick up the first book, like, now, because it just sounds amazing. <laughs> Well, thank you. <laughs> so all, you know, leading heroines are usually very strong-willed and loud and kind of witty, you know, or maybe not loud, but witty and, you know, in control. Is Petra one of those type of characters? I think she is uh, very much a cerebral heroine. She's not much of a fighter. Um, if presented with a situation uh, that's over her head, she will put together some kind of a MacGyver-like contraption to get herself out of trouble. Uh, rather than fight. Um, in the first book, for instance, um, she's imprisoned and she builds herself a flamethrower with bits and bobs from where she's imprisoned to get herself out. Um, she's a little bit timid about uh, the idea of shooting people. It kind of freaks her out, but we're kind of in a sort of a Wild West milieu, and that's something that she'll have to come to terms with. But I think she is a softy in many ways. She, as I mentioned, picked up a uh, coyote familiar who's sort of her sidekick for the stories. And um, she has her arms, her hands full, pretty much keeping him in uh, dog food and lunch meat. Mm -hmm. Dog food and lunch meat. Wow. Okay. Well, I guess that's what a coyote would eat, right? I guess. He eats anything. He has managed to get into her refrigerator. He hops in her truck and follows her along and goes to the local deli and, you know, picks out what he wants pretty much. Wow. So does she have, like, a love interest? Because, you know, sometimes love interests seem to go hand in hand with paranormal, so does she have <laughs> one? There is a small romance in uh, the books. Uh, Petra runs across Gabriel, who is the leader of the Hanged Men. And he is sort of stymied by her because she's not really afraid of him. Mm -hmm. um, but she can't quite figure him out, and she's realizes that there's something funny going on with the hanged men. She's found some of their glow-in-the-dark blood and other things, and she can't quite figure it out with science, so curiosity is her overwhelming emotion, and that sometimes gets her into trouble, and it could get her in trouble with the hanged men, because they are not all nice guys. Oh, wow. So, glowing blood. Oh, it's, it's just getting more and more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, like, with all of these different aspects, you know, of alchemy and just fantasy in general and world building did you have any challenges you know in your research or writing you know bringing this series to life I think one of the things that is a challenge but something that I really love and I think that is important for any kind of urban or contemporary fantasy is to have a sense of place because the setting is a character in itself and I really wanted um the idea of Yellowstone to come through, that there's this really magical world out there that all on its own, I mean, without any supernatural stuff, is pretty magical. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are, you know, pools there that are cobalt blue, and there are all kinds of interesting seismic um, features, like there's a petrified forest, and, and many other places that I hope to get to visit in these books that are just really unusual, and there's no place like it on Earth. Oh, that's cool. So did you visit Yellowstone and all of these, you know, this area to do some research for it? Or I did. I got to visit um, a couple of years ago, and it was just, it just blew me away. And I thought, oh, I want the opportunity to write a book about it. So I met the place before I met the characters in my head. 
Wow. So you saw the place and then the story just kind of developed on its own or you just had like two different ideas and said, oh, they will work perfectly together or how did you melt that together? Well, I kind of marinated in the place and uh, the characters started coming to me. And of course, I really believe strongly in having animal sidekicks as often as I possibly can in my books. So the coyote came pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. And then one of the things that I, I usually do for books is I get out my deck of tarot cards and I try to figure out some of the archetypes and the strengths and weaknesses of the characters. And I came up with uh, the hanged man card. And I thought, and then I started to, to riff on what the idea of the hanged men would be and if there was an alchemical tree of life and, you know, those types of things. So, yeah, the ideas, you know, came together over a few weeks. And I, I was pretty pleased with how much fun it was to do the research for this. Oh, that's cool. So Petra and her sidekick, Coyote, I mean, <laughs> obviously you're into, you know, book two is published. You know, has her character kind of, transformed at all or grown in a you know a specific way that you know kind of is I guess speaks to you like as the she's you know as the series goes on usually Mm -hmm. you know the heroine kind of you know as she starts to get more familiar with like um the fantasy portion of the story and what's what and getting her grounding you know usually they kind of transform in a way does Petra do that Yeah, she really has a lot of evolution to go because she arrives in Temperance being a complete skeptic. I mean, think like Agent Scully level skeptic. And uh, she has to accept a lot of things that are completely out of her experience. And part of the reason why she came to Temperance was that her father disappeared there uh, decades before. And she discovers that her father was actually an alchemist and had been noodling around with some of these things in the back country. And part of her quest is to find him. And uh, she's got to figure out exactly how far she'll go and what she'll sacrifice to find this person who hasn't been in her life for for many, many years. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's kind of cool. So, yeah, I like Petra so far, and I haven't inspired (laughs) her yet, but she sounds sounds interesting. It's very cool. I enjoy her. That's cool. So how many more books are in store for Petra and Sig? Well, fingers crossed. I'm uh, working on a... A proposal for a third story, so we will see how that goes. I am, uh, I have in my head, of course, in my in my perfect world, I could uh, go on about this this world for for many many books, but we'll just have to wait and see what happens. Yeah, well, you know, trilogies are a thing now, so you know you've got to at least get one more. <laughs> you know, you've got to close up all the storylines, right? And like that. You know, right. Speaking of that, like, do you have to, do you think that it's, you know, necessary that we read Dark Alchemy in order to enjoy Mercury Retrograde, or are they kind of separate? You know, I have some overarching themes, and, you know, like you mentioned, the character evolution and such. Um, it's great if one can start with Dark Alchemy, but it's not totally necessary, because the uh, the story in Mercury Retrograde is kind of a, a different episode with a different creature and uh, some different challenges, but... Mm-hmm. Um, I wouldn't say it's absolutely necessary. Okay, well, that's always good because, you know, usually with um, series, we do a, um, we get a lot of, um, I guess, refreshing (laughs) in the next book (laughs) and the the subsequent book after that and after that, you know, which can be good, you know, it it can be good to refresh us on what happened several books ago, but, you know, sometimes when it's kind of not necessarily that way, that I enjoy that as well. (laughs) And then, you know, you can jump in without feeling lost. So that's always a good thing. Right, right. Yeah. So is there anything else you would like the readers and the audience to know about Mercury Retrograde or the series overall? Uh, Just that I'm having a lot of fun with it, and I hope that they have fun with it, too. Okay, I bet they will. You guys, the link for this book and the first book um, are going to be in the show notes below. So um, you can find those on Amazon or pretty much anywhere, right, Laura? Yes, they're also at Barnes & Noble, Amazon, uh, Books A Million, um, pretty much anywhere that uh, you can think of. They should be available. Okay, awesome. So outside of pitching your third book in this series, what else are you working on? Wow. Well, I'm looking forward to Rust City Book Con coming up in August. I'm uh, getting all ready for that. And um, I've got uh, the Pickerington YA Book Fest here in Columbus coming up this summer. And I just uh, finished with the Ohioana Book Festival 
uh, last weekend. So it's 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 kind of a going to be a busy summer, and I'm looking forward to uh, the World Fantasy Convention in Columbus uh, later on in the fall. So that's cool. So are you signing books at all of those events? Um, it should be most of them. A couple of them, I might just be showing up as a as a bystander to just uh, you know fangirl people. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. You know, I haven't like let's see, I've been to a couple of book convention type situations, but I've never lucky for me, I've never had a chance to be like fangirl because I think I would totally embarrass myself. So. <laughs> I've I've had moments where where I could not form words other than than to say I I just love your books you're awesome and the person looks at me like mm. oh my goodness so what authors do you go like fangirl for oh gosh oh I'm trying to think who 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 was I uh, most uh, tongue tied around recently oh. I uh, got to sit with uh, Kelly Grant at uh, the Ohio Anna Book Festival, and she's written just a wonderful trilogy for Harper, Harper Voyager. Um, that uh, and I, I, I really got excited about them seeing the covers. With their, uh, there are large cats on the covers. There are cheetahs, and there are old gods and, and animal spirits and such, which was completely up my alley. And I was very delighted to uh, get the chance to share a table with her at Ohio Anna. So, uh, and then uh, a couple of uh, seats down, I actually got to meet John Scalzi, I had never met before, and, and that was that was a fangirling moment as well. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> that's awesome. I love that authors fangirl or fanboy out over other authors. That's just <laughs> awesome. Of course we do. I mean, everybody has to, you know, has somebody that they idolize or, or are just completely blown away by their work, and if you're you're not at that point, then... If you're not just amazed and, and thrilled by the, the work that your fellow authors are doing, I think that uh, one is a little bit jaded then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, like, um, we talked about who you really like as far as reading. So is there anyone that's, like, kind of influenced you or inspired your re- writing style of those authors or someone different? Actually, uh, the author that really turned me on to fantasy when I was a kid um, was Robin McKinley. And when I was 12, I read The Hero and the Crown for the first time. And it was the first fantasy book that I read that had a kick-butt female protagonist. And at that time, there most of the fantasy uh, that was available was very um, kind of male-centric. You know, the guys go out and slay the dragon and, you know, the the female characters are pretty much stuck in the tower twiddling their thumbs and doing needlework. And I was really thrilled that there was this heroine, Erin, who went out and slew her own dragons because I'd never seen that before. And after I read it, I was just hooked on fantasy ever after. So I think that she was probably the biggest inspiration for me. Oh, that's very cool. You know, I just love when there's like this one book or series or whatever (laughs) that just changes your world. Mm -hmm. You know, like I was telling you yesterday, my relationship with a uh, uh-huh. Bank series I <laughs> yes. mean that, that really changed what I was reading from that point forward mm-hmm. like you know stumbling across that author didn't make me want to run out and write a book but it did make me want to <laughs> consume every single thing that is urban fantasy Right, and I think I've read everything that Robin McKinley has ever produced, and I'm constantly just waiting on the edge of my seat, stalking her Twitter feed, waiting for her to to come up with something new. (laughs) Uh, That's cool. (laughs) So, you know, as always, there are usually some aspiring writers out there, and, you know, they always, you know, seem to want a little bit of advice. So, you know, being that you've published so many books, do you have any advice for the writers or the, you know, aspiring writers out there that are waiting to be published? Well, a couple pieces of advice. Uh, first, uh, the thing that you can do that helps your career the most is to finish what you start. Um, the problem that a lot of writers have is they have a million ideas, and I'm one of those people, and sometimes you just have to pick one and focus on it and uh, see it through to the end um, to actually finish that manuscript. And to that end, I really recommend that people try National Novel Writing Month at least once. Um, I did NaNoWriMo several years ago. Uh, when one of the uh, women in my writer's group had suggested to me, hey, there's this thing, and it challenges you to write 50,000 words a month, and you're in competition with your fellow authors, and blah, 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 blah. And I had never heard of it before, and I thought, that is crazy. Because <laughs> prior to that, I had a, 
a manuscript that I'd worked on for years. I mean, it took me like five years to produce this thing. And it is still living in a shoebox underneath my bed. Um, and I thought it would be just patently impossible to write 50,000 words, which is a good chunk of a novel in a month. But I thought, eh, I don't have anything to lose by trying it. And I'm getting egged on by my friend. And she's promised me that we can talk trash and trade insults during this process. So okay. It's <laughs> there's, there's nothing that, that I have to lose. Uh-huh. So I tried it. And the thing that really helped me in going through the NaNoWriMo process is it helped me get my judgmental inner, inner editor out of the way. Mm-hmm. Because I was one of those people who had read a sentence and I'd stare at it and say, oh, gosh, there's all this wrong with it. And I need to change this, and revise this and, and whatever. But I really, in order to write, need to get that out of the way and just get it down on the paper. Mm-hmm. Because nothing scares me more than just seeing this blank page. And I just have to get the draft out and then I can get to the fun part, which is for me, revising. <laughs> Oh, revising is fun for you. That's awesome. Oh, yeah, it's it's a lot less scary than just looking at the blank screen going, oh my gosh, what is this? Because <laughs> <laughs> So do you have beta um, readers for your series? I do. I have a good friend, uh, Marcella Bernard, who she writes uh, science fiction romance and urban fantasy and steampunk. Uh, she uh, reads my early drafts, and then I make my husband read my early drafts as well and he is long suffering in that respect <laughs> but <laughs> oh he's Both a good husband some husbands oh, would just is. be like no i'm not doing it <laughs> he is he's like i said he's long suffering yeah. but you know he calls me out on on my my baloney and when things just don't make sense and i i need that at that stage <laughs> that's very cool that's very cool that he's like active and willing to help you out because you know like i said a lot of husbands minds will probably be like uh can't you hire someone to read that <laughs> if they want to <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. No, that's just, just, I didn't think that he actually would want to read things, but he, he really is, uh, he reads a lot of historical fiction, so he doesn't read a whole lot that's that's in my genre, but he's totally addicted to Game of Thrones and stuff, so he gets, you know, fantasy in general, and I'm very uh, lucky to be the beneficiary of his opinions. <laughs> that's cool. Do you like Game of Thrones as well? I have not read the entirety of Game of Thrones. I'm, I'm, I've, I'm, I've read part of it, but I am completely current on uh, the television season. Oh. So I'm like, can I, can I say spoilers here or no? <laughs> yes, I don't. Look, you know what, you guys, spoiler alert out there. We've warned spoiler you alert. <laughs> because I love the show as well. So we uh, might spoil something. So plug your ears for the John next thirty Snow! seconds. Snow. John Snow is back! Oh my god! I know! You know, honestly, I thought it would take more episodes than this before he actually came back to life, so... But they couldn't let him rot. You know, once decomposition sets in, it would have been getting a little gross. I know. Me and my husband, we were trying to do the math. We're like, how long have you been dead? We're like, has it been... We're like, is it 28 hours or so? I don't know. It's around there. It's been at least 24 hours. They're like, oh, goodness. (laughs) But then we were thinking, oh, it's kind of cold there, so maybe that's kind of like the equivalent of putting him in a meat locker while they're kind of standing around trying to decide what to do. I don't oh, know. Oh, man. I love that show. It's so good right now. Oh, yeah. I'm just like, cannot believe that. Well, I was kind of wondering how they were going to bring him back. I heard that they were going to, but I thought that Melisandre might have something to do with it. And I was excited that she did. Yeah. And Melisandre's beauty routine, by the way. I, I need to get myself a necklace like that. Oh, my God. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Where do I, I get want that? a necklace like that, too. But I don't ever want to look like how she looks when she takes that thing <laughs> off. I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> Hey, I would just wear it. I'd wear it until I was 110. (laughs) Yeah, I'd never take it off, ever. I'm like, showering in it, sleeping in it. I I don't care. That thing is not coming off. If that's what I look like underneath, it's never coming off. But, you know, whatever. (laughs) Hey, wherever she got that thing, I am looking forward to hearing the backstory on it. Yeah, I wonder if they'll give it to us. That would be interesting. Mm, Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, so I guess we should get back on topic before we're like, oh, get okay, angry we can't fan girl about people. Game of Thrones. <laughs> <laughs> like, stop talking about it. I haven't watched it. You know how people are. Okay, end of spoiler alert. <laughs> yes, end of spoiler. So, do you have any more advice for writers or? Um, just to it? keep at it. Um, really, you know. And, and to try to come to peace with the idea that there's going to be a lot of rejection. I mean, I still get a lot of rejection. It's something that everybody faces, whether they talk about it or not. 
I mean, there's no magical point in one's career where you get and, you know, everything gets accepted. It, it just, I don't know, it has not happened for me, and I still feel like, you know, that there are other levels perhaps to, you know, get to where maybe that could happen. I don't know. But, yeah, rejection is one of those things that um, you have to accept, you have to learn from, and it helps you get better. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. yeah. That's good advice. Don't get discouraged. Don't get <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I know it can be hard to keep being told no, kind of like a job interview, you know. Yeah. You keep getting turned down. Don't give up. Someone, the right person, mm-hmm. will give you the mm-hmm. job. So That is exactly right, and that's exactly what it's like. Yep. Awesome. So, Rust City. So, have you been to Michigan, to Troy area? Actually, my husband is from Detroit, so I am looking forward to getting a chance to go back and uh, visit some family, too, while we're, we're in the area. So that's going to be a lot of fun. Oh, cool. There's tons to do, and I'm sure being that his family is here, they'll have things lined up for you, probably. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah you know, especially because the weather is still good then. It's really not. Yeah. Hopefully it won't be too hot. Um <laughs> But, you know, lots of local things. And, you know, for people who are also out-of-towners, um, there's like a local, you know, the mall. Oh, my gosh. Somerset Collection Mall is down the street. Oh. Uh, uh, <laughs> yes. It's like the high-end mall. I think it's the high-end mall, like, within, I don't know, three or four, you know, counties or something. It's like you can find everything in there. It's amazing. I have never been, but I have heard of it, and I'm thinking, are they going to let me pass the parking lot? Am I? <laughs> <laughs> Look, you'll be lost really cool. in there for hours. It's so cool. It has this, um, like, walkway that goes over Big Beaver Road to go from the north to the south ends of the mall. Oh. So, it, yeah, it's over the street. So you're walking, and you can see the cars. It's really cool. Oh, neat. I'm going to have to definitely put this on on my to-do list. I think oh, we yeah. also may, since we're going to be uh, in Detroit, go back to uh, the Detroit Institute of Arts. I love going there. And um, uh, I wrote a couple of books that were actually uh, based in Detroit. And one of the inspiration pieces for those books was the Ishtar Gate in the museum, which is just one of my most favorite artistic things on earth. It is uh, the uh, mosaic image of the Suresh a dragon uh, kind of like being. And just to be able to see it in person is, is something else. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, so definitely do that while you're here. I, it's been a minute since I've been down to the DIA. I feel like it's been maybe three years since I've gone. It's time. It, I'm due back for another visit. It's time. <laughs> yeah, it's time. Yeah, absolutely. So while here, what titles are you bringing with you to sign during the book signing event? I think um, I should have Mercury Retrograde um, and Dark Alchemy. I haven't quite figured out all the um, the nitty-gritty with that yet, but um, I should be uh, promoting those books uh, while I'm there. So okay, That's awesome. Do you think you'll be participating in any of the panels? Oh, gosh. I hope so. That would be fun. (laughs) Oh, that would be fun. You know, I'm actually moderating a few of them. I don't know which ones yet because that's still being worked on. But, yeah, um, I get to moderate some. So that should be fun as well. Oh, yeah. I hope I get to be on one of your panels. That'll be great. Yes. I'll see if I can work that out with the organizer. (laughs) I promise I'll behave myself. (laughs) Okay. Well, hey, I don't know if I promise I'll behave myself. I might have a drink before, so I don't know. I can't make any promises. If you are having a mandatory drink panel, I will be there. You know what? <laughs> Whether you want I mean, me there or not. <laughs> look, I may make that happen. And you know what? The organizer is lenient like that. So she may be there with us. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> That's so I can, awesome. Anybody who shows up with a couple of drinks in hand can uh, sit on the panel. Excellent. <laughs> oh, I know, right? That would be a really fun panel. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> or I'll just sit in the audience and heckle. Whatever you prefer. Oh, no. <laughs> heckle nicely. <laughs> I'll shout out Game of Thrones nicely? spoilers. <laughs> you know, yeah. isn't that like a oxymoron heckling and nicely like together? Well, I mean, I would just shout out Game of Thrones spoilers. Oh. I mean, it really wouldn't be, you know, real super heckling, but just just a little annoying. Oh, that's so funny. Oh, my God. Oh, you're killing me. <laughs> Jon Snow is alive! I know. Well, hopefully by then everyone has watched it. And if not, shame on them. That's their own Oops, fault. I didn't say spoiler warning before doing that. Darn it! <laughs> oh, well, I don't know. If they are on the social media at all, I'm sure they've seen it. And if not, they're under a rock. So, Sorry! 
You know what I'm also really looking forward to is uh, next year, and that left on a cliffhanger, is do you watch Rick and Morty? No, I don't. What is oh, it? Oh, it's a it. great cartoon. It's a great cartoon. It's about uh, this little boy whose uh, dad, whose uh, granddad is uh, kind of a deranged scientist, and they have all these adventures through time and space, but they left us with a cliffhanger of the uh, grandfather uh, getting in prison, in, wind, winding up in space prison, actually. And it's just really kind of fun and twisted. And I never seem to find anybody who's in that fandom, but maybe I'll find some folks at, at Rust City who know Rick and Morty spoilers. Uh, what um, station is that on? What what network? I think it's Fox. I think it's Fox. Yeah. I'm going to have to look that up. It can't happen. Oh, it's hysterically funny. Okay, I'll look it up. <laughs> <You talk laughs> it's it's really it. funny. <laughs> Okay, well, I guess that's all I have for that stuff. So I guess we can jump into the lightning round, which I absolutely love. It's Woo! like super fun, and really, it's really easy. We're supposed to do this for 60 seconds, and I'll ask as okay. many questions as I can. And during okay. that time, I'll have some questions that are like A or B, or and then I'll have some open-ended questions as well. So, okay. um yeah, the only rule is you cannot say neither or both. You have to pick A <laughs> or B. <laughs> okay, and I can't shout out any Game of Thrones spoilers. Got it. Right, okay. right. Because I kind of feel like that would be, you know, neither or both are kind of cheating to me. So no True. cheating. <laughs> okay, no cheating. I'll be here. Okay, awesome. So let's do it. You ready? I'm ready. Okay, awesome. Physical book or ebook? Physical book. Hero or villain? Villain. Tea or coffee? Tea. Name a book that you've read in one sitting. Um, Jonathan Livingston Seagull. Mm, beer or wine? <laughs> wine. Action or thriller? Action. Milk chocolate or dark chocolate? Dark chocolate. Me too. Vampires <laughs> or werewolves? Vampires. Where is your favorite place to read? Outside. Yeah, okay. Dog or cat? Cat. Cake or pie? Oh. <laughs> okay, what were my choices again? Cake or pie? Cake. <laughs> Cake. All right. Android or Apple? Apple? Oh, Question boo. mark. I'm team Android over here, boo. <laughs> <laughs> Question mark? <laughs> yeah, Marvel or DC? Oh... DC, because of Wonder Woman. Oh, yes. Good answer. And that is it. We are out of time. Yes. That was fun. <laughs> Look, I have so many of these questions. I can just go on and on and on. So I had to max myself out at thir uh, 60 seconds or it would just be ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> the, the cake and pie one was really aw awesome and difficult to answer. I was thinking, wow, cake, pie, cake. What was the question? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, I love them both. But, you know, if I had to pick... I think I would pick cake because, I mean, well, cake with a caveat, because I hate sugary, thick, you know, the frosting that you can peel off. So I always, oh, take, the, I always take the icing off, but I eat the cake. I love the cake. I like buttercream frosting. I don't like fondant, but buttercream is, is, is my, yeah. But I think it can be overdone. It definitely is overdone sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. But cake is the stuff. That's the business. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. so, yes. <laughs> so if you have a panel there will be cake and there will be wine may i yeah, ask red wine specifically okay excellent excellent <laughs> we might throw in some dark chocolate because we both like that as well oh heck yeah mm -hmm. yep so no everyone if you see tamara ford and laura bickle you guys want to be in our <laughs> panel <laughs> And bring we'll wine and cake. <laughs> yes, we'll be partying and eating bad things, so it's all good. <laughs> Hey, what oh. happens at Rust City stays at Rust City, right? Exactly. That's my motto. That's that's how I'm thinking about this totally. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that was really fun. You know what? Seriously, I can talk to you for like a long time. You're so easy to talk to. <laughs> well, thank you. I think you're incredibly easy to talk to, too. And you talk about cake. Hello. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. <laughs> Um, is there anything else you want to share with the audience before we sign off? Just that it was great to have a chance to talk to you in person, and I'm really looking forward to getting to meet you over the summer. Very excited. Yes, me too. I think it would be awesome. So, yeah. So, you guys, I have links 
for Laura's books below. I also have her social media links below. So you want to follow her all over the internet, Twitter, Facebook, all those good places. I know you want to. So just click the button <laughs> and do it. <laughs> And while you're clicking buttons, be sure to hit the follow button for me on Spreaker because a lot of Wednesdays I'll be doing this at 6 o'clock and I know you don't want to miss it. So hit the follow button so that you get a notification when I am live. And that is all we have for today. Thank you so much for listening. And until next time, happy reading. Bye, guys.